So we thought, decided because we we're going to talk about brands, rather than me introduce these people, we're going to let them introduce themselves as brands. So you're a brand. You've managed yourself for your life. You've done phenomenal things in your life. Can you share with us in a few minutes what does that brand embody and how did you get here and what's the brand journey been? Sure, and, and I appreciate you saying I've done phenomenal things, but no one does anything alone. So part of my brand is I recognize that everything happens with teams of people and by bringing diverse perspectives and diverse thinking into a room can create such a greater outcome. So something that's been um, important to me in my career is really listening to people and not just listen to hear them, but really listening to understand and then seeing how we can take ideas into action. And so I started my career at Coke 15 years ago in Hispanic marketing. And fast forward, you know, 15 years later, being the chief marketing officer of a phenomenal brand, knowing that someone else actually created it, I didn't, it's 124 years old. So I have to keep that legacy and the strength of the brand. But also where we are in this world where multicultural consumers are the fastest growing population. I look at that and I say making those connections and leveraging and tapping into the people throughout my career, I think is gonna, what's gonna be continued to make Coca-Cola a phenomenal brand. And I'm fortunate that I get to be a part of it. So I feel like in, in, if I had to talk about me as a brand, it's really about making connections and understanding people and behaviors. Fantastic. So Laura, you spend a lot of time dealing with people like B, like her. Yeah. Like her. <laughs> uh, and we'll talk about that later. But uh, can you talk about Laura, the brand, and what you've done with, uh, with, with Starco? Sure. Um, you know, I, I, I think starting at home might be a good place to start. I, I grew up uh, with, with a dad telling me just about every time we were in the car driving somewhere alone, you know, Laura, you can be whatever you want to be. And, you know, as a child of the 70s and 80s, you know, I benefited from things like Title IX and, and uh, a lot of uh, unbelievable legislation and court rulings that really opened up opportunities for women. So um, that kind of partners with my mom, who uh, damn well made sure I was going to be everything <laughs> I, I wanted to be. Uh, and so a little bit of dreamer and a little bit of discipline. Um, I started at Leo Burnett Advertising about 23 years ago. And truthfully, I would have left a long, long time ago in my journey in advertising. but there always was something two to three to four years um, that challenged me a bit further. Uh, whether it was living in different uh, countries of the world, uh, whether it was working on you know, domestic assignments, global assignments, um, you know, just this sense of I could always push the outer boundaries. Uh, and that kind of fearlessness or that sense of restlessness has, I think, uh, carried me well uh, because it's, it's actually led me to try to build teams that not only make things happen, but also help push me out of a comfort zone or work with clients who not only help build capability, but push us to do better and better things on their behalf. Uh, so you know, from that perspective, I think uh, some of those, those, those elements have shaped you know, what I think is sort of becoming the next stage of who I am or who I will become, which is you know just know, you know being being a leader of a large organization, um, and 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 what my role in that organization is as a leader. And you start to move much more into purpose, uh, into what you stand for. You can't do it all. Uh, you have to bring clarity. You have to simplify things for people. So, as I've as I've taken over the helm of Starcom MediaVest Group, I've really spent a lot more time about you know. Understanding my role in shaping vision, understanding my role in, a, in, in, in inspiring and assembling a great team, and then understanding my role in shaping a culture, not only for our company, but with our clients, because I believe that our culture is very connected to great clients like B and, 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 and several people here in the room. Great. So, Guy, you manage brands, but you're a brand yourself. Now, I overheard you say earlier, you're driven purely by fear. <laughs> well, I started by fear. Okay. Um, the, f you're, the first time I'd ever um, thought of as an executive as a brand was when I was 17, 18 years old. I met David Geffen. And uh, David and, and I come from the music business, and David is really the king of all kings in the music business. And what I was blown away by was how uh, he mentored me, and, and I would see Bill Clinton coming to his house, and I would see uh, actors and um, me and, and agents and all types of 
Warren Beatty, and, him. and I would think like, this guy, 99% of his money and, 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 and work comes from music, yet no one looked at him as just the music guy. They looked at David Geffen as, he's our guy and he connects us. And so I immediately you know, uh, ran with that concept. And um, because I was working with uh, Madonna, what was to be Maverick Records at 17, 18 years old, I was one of the first kids to have a real job. And so I immediately started to um, do the same thing in my world. And, and, and if a, an actor or a comedian or a musician or a model or a director or a writer, if they were bubbling up, if they were uh, um, doing something and, and, and it was connecting, I would immediately bring them in. And I would, they'd stay at my house, they'd live on my couches, they would, uh, uh, you know, I would, I would take them in and, and really be uh, an ear and, 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 and connect dots for them. And so now, 20 years later, I, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, even the music was a big part of my base. I don't think people see me as uh, the music guy, they see me as a connector. And today I have uh, a partner in a management company for actors and I'm developing films and developing brands. And, and, and now I'm connecting those same people 20 years later to some of the people in the audience today on how to um, um, reach their goals or their potential brand and brand connectivity. So well, that's... You know, you're responsible for my daughter being crazy about vampires. <laughs> okay. yeah. okay. Were you responsible for the Twilight series in some I ways? got very lucky with the Twilight thing. Um, but uh, Stephanie Meyer is, is, is really responsible. I just was able to push her along one step forward. There you go. Now, David, you, uh, as we talked about earlier, the fastest way to make a million is to start with a billion in the airline industry, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, and you've done it four times. So tell I us about that. I don't know how I ended up in this, in this business. But you know, I, it's interesting, because when I, when I speak on college campuses and I speak to audiences and, you know, in different places in Brazil or Stanford or wherever, I always ask this question. Um, think of five companies that you absolutely adore that you love, that you, you know, you don't even look, check price, you don't check anything, you just go straight there every time they, a new product or something you're just connected to. And you know what I, my, my experience is that most people can't think of five, <laughs> which I think is really great if you want to start a business because there's very few companies that people are absolutely insured to, connected to. We're gonna do that now, David, you know that. So, right? so yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, um, I, I see myself as, as a person that tries to create companies like that. And, it, and it's a pretty simple formula. It's not complicated. You don't have to read volumes of business books to figure it out. It's actually really simple. But it requires a, a ton of focus. And it's managing details every single day, customer at a time. And you know, we, we did that at JetBlue. Um, you know, I find that companies that have a bigger loyal following make more money, have higher profit margins, grow quicker, you know, and, and I watched at JetBlue where, you know, we started out with three flights a day, Fort Lauderdale, New York, Delta had three or four flights, and the next thing you know, we had 25 flights and they still had three. You know, why do we have 25 and they had three? Obviously, people like this better than they like flying on them. And uh, so it's, you know, it's really just hiring the best people um, and training them well. And, and you know, I, I have two goals for, for our airline in Brazil. It's very simple. I just said, I want, and I tell our people, I want this, I want you 30 years from now to be able to say, this is the best job you ever had. 30 years? 30 years, 40 years, two weeks, two months. I want you to tell your grandkids when they say, what was your best job? Say, Azul, it was the best job I ever had. And then I want every customer to get off a plane saying, wow, that was the best flight I ever had. I said, if we can just accomplish those two things, and I can't do number two without number one, then we're gonna, we're gonna grow quicker than everyone else, we're gonna be more successful. And so in our second year, we're gonna do you know, half a billion in sales, next year probably a billion. And we're growing, and, and we're doing it just because we have a lot of loyal customers, and, and uh, you know, we're trying to be um, flawless in our execution in every single area. If we mess up, we try and make it right with our customers, and we have the best people. It's a very simple formula, but you know, if you lose focus, and I think you know, for those of you that have flown JetBlue in the last couple of years, I don't think it's the same company as it used to be. It's still better, I think, than everybody else, but it's a focus issue. It's like focus every day, every day on those little things, lines, ticket counters, you know, um, uh, waiting on, on the phones, timing every bag to every carousel to make sure that every bag's off in 20 minutes. Those are the things that customers really appreciate. So, 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 so that's my brand. It's, yeah. it's just trying to create, you know, take very simple principles, 
organize people together, try and teach them these principles and have them teach each other and grow a company that is in a commodity business that is growing quicker than other companies that has better profits um, and, and just creating a, a better company. So that's, that's why so I'm trying What's to the simple formula for Coke? I mean, what's the simple formula, just like that simple formula? Now it's about the know, customer you know and the, the experience. You know the formula secret. We don't give that oh, secret formula. Oh, that's true. <laughs> that's the reason we don't know the formula for Coke. That's exactly so right. So like Google, we don't give the secret. Don't algorithm. give the secret yes. away. Now, you know, for us, we talk a lot about brand love and brand values. So having people say they love the brand is just as important as driving profitability for us because we know that one leads to the other. And what's your insight? Why do people love Coke? You know, it's interesting. If you ask someone, why do you drink Coke, not love Coke, but if you first start with that, why do you drink Coke, most of them say, oh, I remember when I was a kid and I got to have it at my birthday party and my parents let me have it in the glass bottle and it was so cold. And they talk about the experience with friends and family. It's very rare that they say, oh, it was really great, I was thirsty and dehydrated and it hydrated me. And so thinking about the extrinsics and getting people to tap into those emotional connections. And what I loved about the sessions here today is I saw little glimpses of neuroscience and research around how that connection happens mm -hmm. in the brain. And that's something that we're still trying to understand. So we're on a journey there, but we know that if we have the right imagery, the right messaging and contextually relevant ways of family and friends, that it seems to drive that love for the brand. So Guy, what helps drive, you know, what's the simple formula for managing individual brands? And David talked about building a great business around customer service. Uh, he talked about Coke. You manage Madonna, right? Yeah. Well, what's, what's the story, what's the simple formula for her brand? Uh, well, if, if I started out of fear, she started out of being fearless. Um, I mean, she is absolutely, you know, up for any challenge and um, is more excited by um, new innovative ways to do things and new sounds, new ideas, new fashion than uh, looking at what's happening today. Um, and she, she just is willing to take risks. I think the key thing is, is being fearless and hard, hardcore work ethic, but uh, r really willing to take risks, willing to maybe fall flat on your face um, but just do what feels right to you and, and, and you know, um, just race your own race. So, Laura, what about, you work with lots of brand customers. In your mind, who are some of the examples, we'll do the David trick, name those three or four sure. brands that, corporate brands that you believe have a very simple story and they execute perfectly to that story. Sure, I mean, um, Coca-Cola, Walmart, Procter & Gamble, um, Blackberry Rim, um, Kellogg. Uh, Notice no digital brands in there. No digital brands? Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we, every once in a while we, we, uh, we do some projects and do some consulting work on the side, but um, uh, what I find actually is very interesting is, uh, you know, transforming and reframing brick and mortar brands or tangible brands into, um, into competing in this new space. And, and, and integrating both sides of the brands. So you've What's got- What's the best example recently? Well, Walmart, for example, Walmart, walmart.com, very interesting story. I mean, um, uh, very few people know that if you click on any, if you order anything at walmart.com, you can have it shipped for free and pick it up at the store two days later. So will they take Amazon um, on that way? Well, you know what? I don't think they want to focus on just one channel because I think they think that with .com and, and the stores, they can compete on a multi-channel basis. They can be and, and, mm -hmm. and. And I think that for them it's an appropriate strategy. But I think what's kind of interesting when I look at some of the, the clients that we work with is, it, I think that the old dynamics of the traditional marketing model were really set on love and respect. And B did a great job of explaining why, you know, Coke is a loved brand. Google is a loved brand. It's also a respected brand. Um, I think that what's going to be interesting in the new 21st century era of marketing is I think you're going to be balancing now love, respect, and utility. So this notion of I can take action with this brand. This brand enables me to do something. This brand facilitates, whether it be purpose-based marketing or something that's specific, you know, closer to home. Um, this brand helps me live a healthier life. This brand helps me with health and wellness. So. I, I, I think it'll be interesting to watch great brands now shift from 
balancing love, respect, and now balancing love, respect, and this notion of action or utility. And, and, and there's no doubt in my mind the digital world and the, and, and the internet has to, it, it, will, it will live there for them and they're going to have to embrace that in order to get to that third leg on the stool. So David, you talked about you give these speeches and people tell you there are three or four brands that they love. What are the ones that come up most often? Well, Apple obviously comes up with everybody, you know, in, in a lot of ways. But, you know, it's, um, you know, for a while there, Dell had a, had a really strong following. If you want to just talk about the technology side, there's clothing, you know, Nordstrom, I think, always comes up in, in people's story. And, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people sell clothes and they just do it different. You know, they train their people to make you feel better when you walk in the store. So, you know, like I said, these things aren't, aren't difficult. And it's amazing to me that, um, you know, people haven't tried it more. You know, JetBlue, we can't, um, unfortunately, we can't do this in Brazil because so many laws down there and there's so, you know, costs are completely different. But so Brazil has more laws that constrain advertising than the U.S.? Well, they, they constrain a lot of stuff, but <laughs> one of them is that every single, if you call a JetBlue, every single person that you call will be in their home, in their furry slippers and bathrobe, talking to you on the phone at 2 in the morning or midnight, home with their kids, and so they're just happier people. And they, they, you know, I think that's one of the strengths of JetBlue is the people on the phones. So it's some, simple. Why wouldn't everyone do that? You know, so why? When I call JetBlue, somebody's in their bathrobe at home on their yeah. phone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, every single An person. Interesting experience. Every single person. So they're in their comfortable chair. They're relaxing. You know, they're not having to drive. You know, get dressed and drive across town, and get in a call center that's hot and stuffy or noisy. So they're just happier people because of that. And why wouldn't everyone do that? You know, it's better for the, econ the environment, it's better for... This is a new call center model. Everybody should just shift them back to people's homes. Yeah, it's a, so, it's, so it's a very simple thing, but nobody does it just because they just have this paradigm that they can't control the people. And you can control them just as well because you have all the... You can listen in, you can check their stats, everything the same. So just a little st stupid thing like that. But those people, you know, it's 2,000 people and they just have a happier life. So, That's interesting. Um, you know, we, it's, you know, same thing in Brazil. In Brazil, our, our, you know, our people, the culture down there is a little different. I mean, there's a separation between management and people. They eat in different lunchrooms. They, you know, there is a little bit more of a, uh, it's not egalitarian. It's more aristocratic. So I, you know, eat in the lunchroom with them. I go work the airport. I, you know, shake all their hands, and they're just, like, blown away. They're just like, why would you? I've never met the CEO of any company I've ever worked for before. Why wouldn't you do that? You know, it just seems st silly not to. But it just makes them more loyal, you know, to the company. So it's just little, little things like that, and the inconsistency and treating people well in every every turn. That's interesting. You're you're always focusing on the customer experience or the employee experience. Uh, that's it. Well, you can't you can't have a, you can't force them to, to take care of customers unless they're taken care of first. Right. So you know, it, you know, we live by things like net promoter scores and all that kind of stuff. But it, it's it's not that hard. It really isn't. It just needs to focus, and it's something you wake up and think about. You know, really, you know, every single day. So, Guy, who are the top five individual brands you you sort of think about when you talked about Madonna as being a being a brand? It's individual five brands. Individual brands. Um, I would say Oprah. I would say Madonna. Um, I would say um, Michael Jordan. Still, that's uh, a very U.S. centric view, no? Yeah. <laughs> and I would say. Um, I'm thinking worldwide. Um, Ronaldo would be. Uh, um, uh, sports is 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 always uh, universal. Um, so that those are the four. Well, there was a panel earlier in the morning over here where they talked about Osama bin Laden being a brand. Right. Oh, Jesus is a brand for sure. Jesus is a brand. There he rocks. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes, yes. <laughs> So now, they were also, there's a big conversation around how do you create a positive brand towards change? You know, they were talking about the, the yeah, I, they were talking I about. Yeah, I would love to sit with Osama Bin Laden and say, okay, let's manage your brand. It's really bad right now in some areas. <laughs> and, uh, what would you do? I mean, uh, well, he'd be doing lectures, putting out books. Um, I would definitely, you know, he, he, it would be a big change. It would be a big announcement on Oprah. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> and, so you'd be leveraging one yeah, brand for the he's other. Gonna come home, his kids, he's got a thousand kids. They're all gonna show up. They're gonna, you know, give him hugs and, and we're shave. gonna make peas. <laughs> I'm gonna have Shaver. Netanyahu's gonna be them. there. It's we'll gonna be lots of tears. 
and we're going to make peace, and, and then, then there goes the tour. Now I'm going to send them on tour. <laughs> Stadiums but, everywhere. But Stadiums. on a more serious note, we talked about leveraging an individual's brand. Now, now, how do you take a brand like Madonna and continue to build it from here? Well, I mean, luckily, you know, you, they always say you never want to manage uh, a client who, whose career you want more than they want. <laughs> right? And, and you will find them. You will find them like, come on, I got, what do you mean you're canceling this? I just spent three months setting this up. Oh, um, and, and, and with her, you know, she's determined. So it's always, you're always better off immediately out the gate with someone who has determination. Um, and, um, you know, she is always, I'll, I'll give you an a, a example of something which, which gives you the mindset. Um, when uh, our last record deal was up, we had 25 years at Warner Brothers Records. And um, we sat down and discussed, you know, okay, what do you want to do? We'll go renegotiate. And traditionally what everyone does is renegotiate their deal. And a legacy artist will be able to um, get back their first few albums. That, that, that is, uh, so you can go back and, 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 and th those will come back to you. They revert back. So I said, you know, one of the things that we can go and ask for if you want to stay with Warner Brothers is you can get back your first few albums. Now, that's a very emotional moment for an artist uh, to think that, their first song, the thing that they wrote when they first made it, their first albums, it's, it's everything to them is the beginning. And wow, I get the ownership of that back. And so that, that, that usually is, a, you know, 10 out of 10, a, a yes, how do I do that? And, and shockingly, her immediate answer to me was, why do I want my first albums back? Hmm. And I, I said, well, what do you mean? She goes, well, I don't care about my past. I care about my future. Let the past be the past. I'm more excited about what's next. And really that defines who she is because that's not the easy answer. The easy answer is let's stick with what we've been doing, it's traditional, and, and she chose to take a different path. We don't even know what that path is today. But what we know is, is it's not the traditional path and that she's willing to shake it up again and, and that she could care less about what everyone else you know, considers everything to them and willing to let go of that and start brand new. So Laura, we're, we're, the topic is mind shift. We're talking about thinking differently and changing sort of gears. Uh, there's a lot of conversation around the digital revolution, people going online, 1.7 billion people on the web. Uh, there's a notion out there that brands are getting built faster than they ever used to get built. There's a 124-year-old brand called Coke. There's a 10-year-old brand called Google. Probably a five-year-old brand, brand called Facebook. What is your view for you know, how sort of the instant branding that's going on now? You know, brands getting formed in five years and getting to the top of the charts, and 100-year-old brands, they're sort of you know, having to be seconded to these kinds of brands. What is your advice or what is your view on that topic for all the people here who are building brands, who are running businesses? And how do you manage that brand in that such a fast-paced environment? Do you still do what David's talking about? Sure, sure. I mean, I, I think there's a, a the mind, sh mind shift uh, that I think is most acute for, for large advertisers is this notion of shifting time. So brand building was a longer period of time. You would work for months on a campaign that might be, maybe had three or four commercials that would run for six months to a year. You'd work for months on one great ad that might run in the Super Bowl. Uh, now, um, there, is no, uh, there is no space and time. Constant optimization, constant iteration. Um, very few, fewer and fewer clients are spending their time on those great three ads that are going to run for six months and, and instead are trying to figure out, okay, how do I efficiently version? How do I scale and produce things much easier so I can have my media companies segment and sequence different types of content? A lot of other companies are really kind of coming to grips now with this notion of, we talked about it yesterday at the panels, this notion of you know, what's, what's free, what's paid, what's owned. You know, the, own, the ownable media assets that companies enjoy are not leveraged at all. I think that we're looking at a pivot point where people are going to start leveraging them much more, and, and the internet is a classic place to do that. Earned is, I think, probably the space right now that's getting the most churn. Um, it's not just mobile, it's mobility. I think the iPad has kind of opened up our minds to the fact that, you know what? Um, I have a very different media experience with the iPad than I do with a smaller screen on, on the mobile. Uh, and, and, but I can take it with me. So I think this notion of portable, mo you know, portable mobility is, is changing. This notion of, of um, free uh, media, this notion of how do I integrate my PR programs into this. So 
The thing that I think that a lot of brand builders are looking at now is how do I string together elements of paid, elements of owned, elements of earned together, and how do I measure that? And how do I prove that it's either building my brand equity, uh, improving my consumer or customer delight, and how do I then continue to optimize it and, and, and show and build on it so that I'm building more and more shareholder value? One of, these th one of the things that I think you're going to start to see is that um, uh, we need to start to think of CMOs not so much as just brand builders, but I think builders of, sh of brand value that does have a monetary value on, on a balance sheet and to the board. And, uh, and we know this to be true. And I, and, I, and I, for one, as we get you know, smarter about managing business metrics, I, for one, want us to start to make these connections so that we know how brand Coca-Cola enhances the shareholder value of the Coca-Cola company in a way that we can track and we can hold CMOs much more accountable to it over these next five to 10 years. I think that's when our discipline will really exponentially go to the next, next uh, next level and, and uh, there'll be, a, I think, a, a, a greater group of people who want to get in and say, I want to manage brands, I want to build brands. So Bina, how does Coke deal with this digital revolution? Does Coke have a Facebook page, tweet and everything? We do, and so... What do you tweet, what does Coke tweet about? Drink me more? <laughs> well, let me, yeah. <laughs> let, let me back up and start with a little bit about how we got into it. So in 2006, we were looking at creating a loyalty program, and it was around people's passions and following the consumers. And so we titled this thing Project Access, and we didn't really know what to do with it, but we said, you know, how come you know the the airline industry the credit card industry has this great formula with their consumers where they can reward their most loyal consumers and give them this extra value that people then you know hoard and seek and, and only stay within those partnerships mm -hmm. so how do we do that but we wanted to flip the model to not just provide a catalog but to follow where people wanted to get those rewards so ultimately, this project turned into what we call MyCook Rewards today. And you know, it's not inexpensive to do something like that. We wanted to try to understand the digital space in terms of our brands and spend our own money to build this community so we would own the data. And today, we have over 15 million registered users on MyCook Rewards. And you know, every second, people are burning about 44 points on this platform. So we're, the platform is amazing, and what it taught us is that, because we've had some key learnings along the way, that what had to be um, put onto this platform around providing people access to the things they love needed to be relevant and culturally relevant and relevant for the time and day. So even though we started in 2006, what we offer today is very different from what we offered in 2006. And then connecting it in the social media landscape. So. Now let me get to Facebook for a moment. There were two individuals who started the Coca-Cola Facebook fan site. Coca-Cola didn't do that. How many followers? So well, over today there's over 11 million followers. Oh. And we had gotten a call from Facebook and they said, you know, we want Coca-Cola to take over this site because that's part of our policies and how we do this. And we didn't even know the site existed. So we worked with our digital teams inside of our building and we called those individuals had them you know, come into Atlanta at Coke, and what they did was really interesting. They followed their journey through video, and they followed the whole journey and the visit to Coca-Cola, and now today we collaborate with them to keep the site alive. And so they keep the pulse on what consumers want. We provide them with the content. They're, in, in essence, considered employees now of the brand. But we try to keep it an arm's length to allow them to tell us what to do because they're closest to the consumer and to what's happening. And by taking that community, connecting it with the MyCook Rewards community, it allows us to do um, some really great programs that do make a difference. Do you think every brand should have a Facebook page? So, you know, I, I don't know. I think that you have to follow the consumers. If consumers think it should have a page and get interested in we it, do. then they should. <laughs> do you have a, does Azul have a Facebook page? Oh, yeah. Orchid yeah, page? We, we have, uh, we're just, we're not 15 million yet, but we have, uh, a, I don't know, over 100,000 Facebook, over 100,000. Twitter followers, and then we have our own social, ne social networking site where you can go on and download all your pictures. It's kind of a trip advisor type of site where you can talk about your travels. And then we made a commitment to everyone who's on those that anything we do 
as far as promotions or lower fares or anything, we tell them first. Yeah. So it's relevant. You know, there's a reason to be on there because you know about a new city announcement, you know about a, you know, a, a fare sale we're going to do, if we're going to do free companion tickets or something. They all know about it first, and so it's, it's really growing. And I think it makes people, you know, they're loyalists. You know, they're, they're part, you know, the, you know, the tipping point. You know, you, you, you know, talk about connectors and people who are mavens. And, you know, I, you know our job is to create as many, um, you know, it, it's interesting. I think this is, this is an interesting point because when I first went to New York, you know, I came off the turnip truck from Utah, and I'm starting <laughs> this new airline called JetBlue. We didn't have a name or anything. And the ad agency came to us and they said, you know, we're going to create your brand for you. We don't know your name, but, you know, give us 175000 a month and we'll be, you'll create your brand. And I said, you know, we're, it's offensive to me because I, we're going to create our brand kind of one customer at a time. And you'll just put a little wrapping on it and make it look good. So I think, you know, you talk about brand and what you do with, you know, how it looks, but also it's how you react and how you deal with your customers. And that's really the important part. It's not, you know, it's... I think people get carried away and think all I have to do is make it look pretty and I'll have a great company. But it's day-to-day you know, -day customer interactions. We talk to each of our customers five times when they travel. We touch them five times and everyone has to be perfect. And then when they become kind of evangelists and they get on our site and they tell everybody and you know, we're, we're doing a, a viral thing where they sign people up for a frequent flyer program, they get points mm -hmm. for everyone that signs up. So all kinds of things. It's, it's huge in Brazil and it's something that we do a lot. But, but Guy, most of your brands look good anyway, right? Uh, they could look better. Yeah, they could, oh, they could look better. Should, what do you recommend? Should they have Facebook pages? Should they tweet a well, lot to a lot of those people? Many different kinds of, of people. Um, you know, some don't do it at all, and some really do it. And, For example? You know, you really have to be committed. Who's the biggest tweeter in your in your? Well, Ashton is is of course is, is really the you know I mean he doesn't just tweet it. He's he really understands. He's really part of the whole thing, and he he is he's out there educating himself on every single thing that's going on, how to. How to you know how to bring social into all the many areas that he is excited about, um, but there's a lot of artists. You know, Madonna's not going to sit there and and, and tweet, um, and it's really a commitment. And if you make it, it's more power to you because you'll have that instant relationship. Um, but you really, it is a commitment. You can't do it and then walk away for a month and decide, hey, I'll I'll check in again. It, it really, you won't. It won't have any sticky, stickiness to it. So it really is a commitment. It's a lifestyle. Commitment and some people have people do it for them, um, which um, you know I think I think if you you know if you pay attention to it you'll know it's 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 not it's just coming in and it's not it's not real it's not genuine. Um, but for me when we go on the road I actually I I, I have a Twitter and so because Madonna's not doing it so when we go on the road uh, I will put up photos every night and and really really connect with uh, the Madonna fans. And if there's tickets left over, I'll say tweet. If you're at this place, this is before Four Square. Are there tickets ever ever left over from a Madonna concert? You know, I may have some on me. Right, there we <laughs> go. <laughs> so you, you know, know, you know the guy who's tweets to follow there, right? That's the sort of connectivity fans really need to. They really need to be. Um, uh, I think music is is probably better at it than anyone else because uh, uh, there's so much new content, and uh, so really music is at the forefront of how to continually share information and do things. And and honestly, if if the artist today, if a new artist today doesn't do that, I don't know how they build up a, a business. You know, if you're not engaging through Facebook or through Twitter or you know some way with your fans, there's just no other way to do it because your the, the 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 money's dried up and there's no other way to get on radio or have money for a video or you know there's no other marketing. Your marketing is you now. You need <laughs> to go out there and and pitch yourself all day long or pitch what you're doing all day long. So we're running out of time, but we almost have. I'm going to ask one last question to all of you, and you have to answer it quickly. On a scale of 1 to 10, in this mind shift from traditional branding to digital branding, and you think about the world out there with all the brands, where do you think the world is on a scale of 1 to 10? Are they ready for it? Are they 9? Are they ready for the big digital mind shift? Are they at a 5? Are they at a 3? P? I think it depends what part of the world you live in. So I'd say I think the world is ready for it. So I'd give it a nine out of ten. And Coke. And I'd say Coke is still learning and on the journey. So we're probably closer to uh, f six. Six. Mm -hmm. Laura. Depends on the target. Teen and youth today, ten. Um, it it goes lower as you get older from there. I think the scary thing for marketers is what do you do twenty years from now when everybody is on this new platform? That's that's really true. Twenty years is a long time in internet. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it'll change however you We have a few more 
Twitter's, Facebook, YouTube's, Google's by then, right? I hope so. <laughs> Guy? Um, I would say that, that it's, it's not where will it be. I'd say that everyone just expects it to be. So I think that the expectation is out of 10, that everyone expects something new to be coming or for Steve Jobs to be every four months showing something brand new, a new way you can have people play live at your house without even having to see them. At a, they'll just show up. You know, Aerosmith is at your house playing live. <laughs> and so that's, that, that, people are expecting. I, th I think if it doesn't move fast, they'll go, what do you mean? Now you can only have one person and, you, you know, we thought the whole audience would be here with me at my house. So, um, so the expectation, I think, is at a 10. And uh, preparedness? Preparedness? Um, preparedness, I'd say, is out, is, is out of five. David? Uh, you know, our, our problem, I think we're, we're like an eight, nine, but, but the country is, you know, there's, th Brazil's very segmented, and only 35% of the people are connected. And those people that are connected pay 10 times um, more for their internet than people in New York pay. So you make a fifth as much money paying 10 times as much. So, you know, it, it, I think for the level, the, the cost of connection, and for the number of people that are connected, Brazil's amazing. And it only has you know further to go, and so we're going to be ready for it when, as they, as this hundred million people of middle class move into the digital age. Well, perfect. Thank you very much. I think we're out of time. Thank, please join me in thanking my panel. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, guys. Thank you, David.